right, class, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to be looking at contemporary strategies dealing with language learning. All right, class, we'll now move into this PowerPoint portion of the lecture for strategy of missions, and we are looking at session number 22, which is religions and cults. And to start off with the introductory material, like we usually do, I did want to point out that this PowerPoint is a brief look at the major world religions. It's a brief look at cults. And in regards to a strategy for handling world religions and cults with a missional mindset, we're going to be looking at another website called CARM.org, and we'll look at that at the end of this PowerPoint, because uh, what I want to do is give you just a basic overview of religions and cults. And so that's why at the bottom of the slide, it says this PowerPoint is not. Okay, so it is not a detailed and comprehensive look at the different world religions and cults, history, and beliefs. And what we have here at Mid-America is we have an actual semester-long course called World Religions and Cults, and that class gives a much more detailed look at the different world religions and cults. There's absolutely no way I can do it justice to be able to go through every uh, major world religion and, and cult and give a detailed history of it and what their belief system is and even the best way to evangelize those uh, different people groups that have those kind of religions or uh, faith followings. So uh, what I want to do here is just basically give you a brief overview and then go through uh, in a little bit more detail, but nothing too detailed, uh, of the CARM website, and I'll explain that when we get to it. So when we look at world religions, we look at these major religions that are outside of the uh, circles of what we would say is Christianity. Now in Christianity, where there's a whole plethora of different uh, branches and religious groups under Christianity uh, that we could talk about. Uh, so we have Christianity uh, with, with the Protestant uh, Christians. We have Christianity with, uh, with Catholics. We have... Um, and in our in our culture, there's even some cults that are wrapped up in Christianity, which we would not say they are Christian in any sense of the word. It's just that our culture has kind of enveloped them in, such as Mormons. They would say, well, that's a Christian religion. But when we look at Mormonism, it's actually a cult. And so when we look at these uh, religions, uh, Christianity has different, different branches and belief systems. So you wouldn't say a Protestant Christian believes the same as a Catholic Christian. Uh, but when we look at world religions, it's outside of the realm of what we would say is Christianity. So when we look at world religions, we have a couple of uh, different ones here on the screen. There's traditional religions, there's Eastern religions. Uh, we could see Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism, and then also Islam. There, we could also talk about Judaism. And, uh, there's many other world religions uh, out there, especially on the local level, local beliefs, local traditional things. So uh, we'll look at these uh, just in a brief, uh, brief way today. So first off is the traditional religions. Like I said, there is a plethora of traditional religions on the local level. And an example is African traditional religions. It could be, it could be a regional, it could be what's in a certain country or nation, a people group. They have different belief systems throughout those different areas. And it's just, it's just uh, way too much to even get into uh, with, with a, this PowerPoint. However, there are uh, common characteristics of these African traditional religions. And so we can look at that and kind of go through that real quick. Uh, number one, there is a general cosmology. There's a general belief system that we can look at with these traditional religions. Again, on the local level, there might be some uh, nuances. There might be some differences here and there. Uh, but for the most part, we have uh, this cosmology where you begin at the bottom. There is a realm of the humans. This is where the people live. This is the people group. This is who they are. But then there's a, some type of an intermediary that could be uh, some sort of a uh, priest. It could be some sort of maybe a witch doctor or some kind of a wise person. Whatever it may be, uh, there is some sort of intermediary that can uh, speak with those that are outside of the realm of humans. So above the uh, intermediary is going to be where you have the realm of the quote-unquote living dead. This is the, the ancestors, this is the spirits, this is the gods, whatever the people group believe in. Uh, so again, this is just a 
common characteristic of these uh, different people groups. Uh, so it could be different within the people, between the people groups, but uh, there's this realm of the living dead, which would be ancestor worship. They're, they live out there somewhere. There's a spirit world. They live out there. And then above that would be a, a remote higher being. There may be a a chief god or something, but th this this is above the realm of the spirits. So uh, you have this kind of general kind of flow, if you will, or kind of general structure of their cosmology. Then number two is that um, most of these, especially African uh, groups, uh, but you can also look at maybe in India or something too on a local level. Uh, there's an animistic worldview where everything that exists have some, has some kind of a spiritual power in it, some kind of a spiritual um, indwelling in it, the trees, the rocks, the animals, the earth, you know, the person, whatever. There's, a, there's an animistic worldview. Uh, number three, uh, there's a two-dimensional time sequence. Uh, the past they can remember. Uh, the past, and then they obviously live in the present, but they don't necessarily focus on uh, the future. They kind of live in the, the now and present. Number four, there is a high God or a high being concept. Uh, there could be different high gods. There could be different ones in power, uh, but there's going to be some sort of a remote high being. And then number five, there is a complex spirit world. There's spirits over things. There's lower gods over things. Ancestors can be involved in there. So there is a complex spirit world. So these are common characteristics of traditional religions. Let's look at the Eastern religions. Hinduism uh, began as an early Vedic Indian religion, and the reason it's called that is because of the ancient writings that Hinduism is founded on, uh, which are called the Vedas. And so these are the uh, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, and Atharva Veda. You can see there what they are. Rig Veda is hymns to the gods. Sama Veda is hymns and instructions for Brahmins, which are the priests. Yajur Veda is, a sac is sacred formulas and sayings that the Brahmins can use. And then the Atharva Veda are spells that can be used. So these are ancient writings that are the basis for Hinduism, but also the caste system in India uh, has uh, become intertwined uh, with Hinduism because after changing from skin color based caste system, because at one time there was differences in skin color, and uh, because people groups intermarried over a, a long period of time, centuries and centuries and centuries, the skin color basically kind of leveled out to a um, consistent skin color of the culture, of the society. And so really there could not be any kind of caste system based on skin color anymore. So that transitioned over to a social structure based caste system, which we're gonna look here next slide. The caste system at the top are the Brahmins, which is that's the priests, that's the Hindu priests are the top of the caste system because they're the ones that are the uh, kind of intermediary. They're the ones that can go to the, the gods and pr do the sacrifices and do the, the things for the people. So those are the priests. Then we have the Kshantriyas, which are the nobility of the princes, the warriors. These are the is the next uh, lowest of the caste. Then we get to the Vaisyas, which are the merchants or the artisans. And this is kind of like the common people that have uh, employment, have a job or whatever. Then you have the Sudras, which are kind of like the slaves. That's the lowest class. And then you get to the outcasts, which are not part of the caste system specifically, but the outcasts where they, they work with uh, refuse. They're the ones that work with dead bodies. Uh, they're the butchers of the animals that can be eaten. Now, obviously in India they don't eat cows, but uh, there's there's the people that deal with the dead and so and, and and with the filth. And so those are the outcasts. So they're actually outside of the caste system. And then we have um, these uh, and, and the caste system is intertwined with uh, Hinduism. Uh, the main belief characteristics of Hinduism is that there's a belief in millions of gods. There's like three million gods or something. Everything is a god. So um, we have millions of gods, but the main three are Brahma, Vishnu, and Siva. Uh, these are the th main three gods. Uh, their belief system is that man is stuck in a cyclical life of karma, the good and the bad that one does. And then when they die, they're reincarnated, which is called samsara. 
they're reincarnated, and then the whole goal of life is to have enough good karma to escape from samsara and finally that escape into uh, what would the, what is basically what would we say uh, heaven. Uh, that escape is called moksha, and that is where one unites with the Brahman or ultimate reality or ultimate consciousness, something like that. Uh, you're united with the Brahman, so that's that's like their heaven. So you have um, this belief system of Hinduism. Uh, next, we have uh, the Eastern religions uh, is uh, Jainism, founded by a contemporary of Buddha, which we'll talk about Buddhism next. But uh, really what it is, it's kind of like reformed Hinduism. And the way that Jainism works is that you purge karma, the, especially the bad karma, through an ascetic life, living a, living a simple and uh, moral and ethical life. And what happens is you maintain purity of the soul by not hurting any living thing. You live such an ethical life that you don't hurt anything else, especially killing anything else. And so this is where the, the people, like, they don't even want to, like, swat at a fly because they don't want to kill or hurt any living thing. They obtain salvation by the right beliefs, the right faith, the right actions. And this salvation is in nirvana, which is a perfect, peaceful consciousness floating above the heavens. And so this is uh, Jainism. Most live in India and are in the business occupation because they never want to physically harm anybody. And I guess in the business occupation, you don't harm people. So uh, this is Jainism. Uh, next is Buddhism. Uh, this is rooted in a Hindu background, but it was founded by Siddhartha Gautama, who is known as the Buddha or the teacher. And this is the founder of Buddhism. Now, one thing is that uh, Gautama never claimed to be a god. He never set out to make some religion where he is worshipped in any way. And really, in Buddhism, they don't really worship Buddha, although uh, over time that has changed to where uh, Buddhism, uh, where they worship Buddha. But uh, uh, he was very pessimistic about the world because what he, what he did was he saw the world full of suffering. And so uh, the Buddhist is very pessimistic about this world and is rooted in the Four Noble Truths. How can one escape this world of suffering? Well, the Four Noble Truths is, number one, the fact of suffering in life. It has to be realized that there is suffering. Number two is the cause of suffering. And in Buddhism, the cause of suffering is craving the wrong things. Number three is a cessation of suffering can be found in nirvana. So there is an answer to it, and that is uh, escaping the suffering world. And so how does one do that? The way of cessation of suffering is by following the Eightfold Path of Buddhism, which we have on the next slide. The Eightfold Path of Buddhism is having, number one, the right views and understanding, and that comes through enlightenment, through meditation, that, that sort of a thing. Uh, number two is having the right attitude. Three, the right speech. Four, the right conduct. Five, the right occupation. Six, the right efforts. Seven, the right mindfulness. And eight, the right meditation. And th this is all works-based. This is all man trying to do whatever they can to achieve enlightenment, such as man having the right attitude, or you have uh, you know, the right conduct, so you have ethical conduct. And, and you have the right meditation. You're able to like empty yourself to be able to, uh, to attain enlightenment. So this is the Eightfold Path. And this has been a, a really popular uh, belief system that has permeated into American culture. You hear it all the time about um, people uh, meditating and, and uh, going, having like, the right Zen and uh, even yoga which, by the way, um, I've already uh, said this in previous lectures with other classes, but um, meditation to empty oneself is through uh, some sort of a chanting, like Om or something like that. So basically what meditation is to the mind, uh, yoga is to the body. It's getting this perfect balance with uh, yoga poses and and basically bringing harmony and... and um, uh, kind of a balance to the physical body. And so I, I always say, I firmly stand on it, that Christians should not participate in yoga. Uh, yoga is a, a Buddhistic and uh, Eastern religion-rooted uh, practice, 
and to take that practice and merge that into Christianity, I believe is inappropriate. And people give pushback to that and say, well, what if it's Christian yoga where we come together in the school gym or the or the church gymnasium and, and the ladies get together and they exercise and they do these stretches and get these balanced poses and, and all of that. Well, you know what? There's plenty of other exercise and stretches people can do where they're not bringing yoga into the, uh, into the Christian mix. And so, you know, just don't do it. What meditation is for the mind, yoga is for the body in regards to Buddhism. And nowhere does it say that we're supposed to empty ourselves. We're supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we don't meditate to empty ourselves. And so on the, in the same, same hand, we don't get into certain poses of balance to have some kind of a balanced Christian life. So uh, I would just say stay away from yoga. But anyway, that's, the, that's my little soapbox, uh, this, the Eightfold Path in regards to Buddhism. And we do know there's different branches of the Buddhism that exist in China, India, uh, Japan, even the United States. There's like Zen Buddhism and, and all that. There's different branches of it. So that's an Eastern religion, uh, Buddhism. Uh, next is Confucianism, founded by Confucius, most uh, known for the many wise sayings of Confucius. Uh, now, the thing is with Confucianism, it's more of a philosophy uh, than a religion. It's not really um, a, a religion where there's like some main god or gods. Uh, instead, it's more of a philosophy, a way of thinking on how to live in life to have a stable society. So he was an, uh, a man that wanted that. He wanted the ideal stable society, and he said the way you can do that is through a focused life dealing with ethical actions. Live a good life, live an ethical life, and, and you'll be okay for your society. So it's more of a philosophy than a religion, uh, but it's based on appropriate behavior, love for others, respecting parents, considering others before yourself, and being loyal to your superiors. And like I said, there are uh, many wise sayings for Confucianism, and they all, uh, when you read these sayings, and you can look that up on your own but they almost sound kind of almost like fortune cookie uh, kind of sayings. So uh, there's Confucianism. Next is Taoism, founded by Lao Tzu. Uh, and the focus is uh, the Tao or the way is what it is. And the Tao is the cosmic energy of the universe. And through appropriate behavior, one can navigate this way. One can navigate the Tao. And so really what it is, a mixture of beliefs, mainly Buddhistic beliefs, um, superstition, magic, mysticism. This is a, uh, it's kind of a mixture of that uh, brought together for to help somebody navigate this life as they navigate the way so that they can become one with the cosmic energy. Uh, next is Islam. So we've left the Eastern religions and now we go to Islam. Again, you can have an entire semester long course just on Islam. So this is just a really quick brief overview founded by Muhammad and um, it's, it's such a huge religion of the world today there's over 900 million people in the world that follow the Islamic faith uh, their sacred text is of course the Quran and there's some other texts that that they follow uh, also like the writings of Muhammad uh, but their main text is Qur the Quran uh, their belief system is based on the five pillars of Islam Islam is a very simple faith to follow. It's very simple uh, because really all you have to do is follow these five pillars. And this is the five pillars of Islam. Uh, number one is saying the Shahada. The Shahada is kind of like what you would say is like their prayer for their type of salvation. And that is to say, uh, I testify that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of God. If somebody says that and truly follow, uh, believes that, then that is kind of like their salvation. But it's a, it's completely works based uh, religion. They have to say the Shahada. They don't. I mean, it's just something that they say. And then uh, number two is that they uh, do the Salah, which is uh, prayer five times a day. This is uh, their. Um, where, where they face Mecca, they could go to the mosque and do this, they could do this in their house or their workplace, they usually have a mat, and they get down their knees and they say the prayers five times a day. Uh, then we have the zakah, which is the giving. They give one fortieth of their income, so it's not a tithe, which is one tenth, but it's one fortieth annually they give, and so that's the, called the zakah. Then they also uh, perform the psalm, which is uh, their fasting, and they obviously fast during Ramadan, which is their uh, month of fasting. And there's those that, that don't fast during that. They're excused from it, pregnant women, uh, children, 
uh, some old people that are uh, infirm or that they would uh, they couldn't fast and and uh, warriors or soldiers uh, they don't fast if they're at war so there is some exceptions to that but it's the psalm which is fasting during Ramadan and and also fasting that, that doesn't mean they don't eat for a month what, basically what it is they don't eat and also the the they don't have sexual relations uh, while the sun is up so once the sun goes down, goes down then they can eat or have sexual relations. So we have the psalm. And then number five is the Hajj, uh, which is a pilgrimage to Mecca that the, um, the faithful follower of Islam must do one time in their life. And that is to go and see the Kaaba stone, which uh, is inside this gigantic box. And they can view through this little portal and see the Kaaba stone, which was supposedly the stone that Muhammad carried with him on his flight. Uh, to Mecca. So we see um, the Hajj. So those are the five pillars of Islam. And then uh, they, there are those that do believe more radical, radicalized Muslims, uh, definitely, uh, that believe that uh, jihad is also part of their faith, which is their holy war. And we're definitely living in the times of today where there is radical Islamists that are doing all kinds of uh, violent activities all around the world. So we see the five pillars of Islam, and if someone follows that, uh, then uh, they, they are basically a, a true Muslim. And that is uh, a very simple uh, religion to follow. Again, saying the Shahada, doing the, the three things uh, throughout your year, praying five times a day, giving a one fortieth of your income annually, and fasting during Ramadan, and then one time in your life uh, doing the Hajj. So it's a very simple religion for someone to follow. Okay, so let's look at cults now. Uh, what is a cult? Well, Webster uh, Dictionary basically says it's a religion that is unorthodox or spurious. So uh, unorthodox religions outside the realm of orthodoxy of the um, general belief system of a religion. So it's unorthodox or spurious, maybe questionable. So we think of like the hale Bop cult where uh, the followers that followed, um, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Applegate who uh, said that the way they're going to go to heaven is to grab onto the tail of the hale Bop comet. And as the comet passes Earth, they would, they would uh, basically grab onto the tail and fly off to heaven with this. And the way that they were going to do it was by having a mass suicide uh, altogether. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the followers of hale Bop, uh, they uh, kill, all killed themselves. Uh, and they, they took... It took place in 1997 when they all uh, got together and took a bunch of uh, uh, pills. Uh, they just a massive overdose on pills and then uh, chased all of that with alcohol. They got into beds and they all died. And uh, that was, I think it was like 39 or 40 people uh, all did this. And that was their, their belief system. They followed this man, Applegate, and said they were going to grab the comet's tail and go off to heaven they went. Uh, well, that's obviously a cult. Uh, there's no way that is uh, within any kind of realm of, of an accepted religion. Uh, you have a lot of other cults. But then there's also cults that um, are, are bigger named, which we'll see here in a second. So what we usually do is we can follow the math formula. And this is going to be looking at cults that are offshoots of Christianity. And so they, they may sound uh, very Christian. They may sound okay. And to a lost world that can be led astray, they can be led astray into a cult that does not offer salvation in Jesus Christ, but it's, uh, it's definitely a cult. And so when we look at these offshoots of Christianity, uh, and we'll look here, Mormons, JWs, Jehovah's Witness, and then Christian Science, um, we look at this, uh, this math formula, add, subtract, multiply, divide. And so what it is is adding to the scripture. So our example we'll look at is the Mormons. Uh, they add to the scripture. They add the Book of Mormon, which is another New Testament of Jesus Christ is what it's called. They add that to the scripture. We have the subtract. They subtract from the deity of Christ. In Mormonology, they, the, the beliefs of Mormons, they believe that Jesus and Satan were brothers. And so what happens is they subtract from the deity of Christ. They basically say that Jesus is on the same level as a created angel, which is Satan. And they, again, just completely uh, unorthodox belief that Jesus and Satan were brothers. Uh, they also multiply ways to heaven. Uh, the ways for heaven there is not just salvation, but they must live the good Mormon life, obedience to the Mormon church. You have to do that also to get to heaven. 
and then divide the body of Christ, again, to be a true follower of Elohim, which is that's uh, taking the language of the Bible and giving it a different definition because Elohim of the Mormon church is definitely not Elohim in the Bible because Elohim in the Mormon church uh, has a spiritual wife. We don't even know her name and they live in the celestial city and they are the ones that are populating this earth through their spirit children. And so, uh, again, nowhere near what the Bible says Elohim, uh, who Elohim is, uh, but uh, you must be a follower uh, of Elohim uh, in the Mormon church. And so they divide the body of Christ saying that you must be part of the Mormon church. So you can see there uh, by that math formula that Mormonism is a cult. And we see on the screen there, there's the Mormons, obviously founded by Joseph Smith, the Jehovah's Witnesses, who was founded by Charles Taze Russell. You have Christian Science, who was founded by Mary Baker Eddy. And you can look into all these different uh, foundings of these religions and clearly see that they're founded on spurious kind of standings. Uh, Joseph Smith getting the translation from the Golden Tablets. You know, the Christian Science with with uh, Mary Baker Eddy. I mean, she she was on this verge of death, and she had this miraculous healing, and you know, she delved into um, this uh, really really odd theology. And so, when you start looking at these things, they sound good, like the the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints or the Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses. You're you're a witness for Jehovah God. Or Christian Science, which is it basically it's called Church of Christ Scientist, is the Christian Science. I mean, it sounds really Christian and can lead a lot of people astray, but they're clearly all cults. Okay, so let's look here um, at this slide. Just a note here for the missional approaches to religion and cults. Um, there, there's going to be specific approaches for each one of these religious groups, and there's no possible way that I can go through these things in any great detail. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to point you to a website that can really be helpful for these uh, activities of, of uh, the missional approach or evangelizing these cults. But just two basic things. Number one, always go into these types of activities with prayer. When you're going to meet with somebody that belongs to these religious groups, you want to pray for every opportunity that you are going into. You pray for the Holy Spirit to be ahead of you. You pray for the person you're going to be speaking to that is part of these false religions or cults. You are going to uh, pray for your own protection that, uh, that about persecution that's going to come your way, uh, whatever it may be. Uh, you want to blanket all of this with prayer. And then number two, you always stay rooted in the scripture. You never try to water it down. You never try to change the, the truth into something else. You never try to adapt the scripture to, to their belief system so that they'll they'll maybe listen to you. Uh, you know, so if you're dealing with a, a Mormon who believes that Jesus and Satan are brothers, you never try to you know take away from the deity of Christ to, so that they will listen to you or have some kind of an open mind about it. You never do any of that. You always stay firmly rooted in the scripture. So what I want to do now is I want to take you to CARM.org and show you a few things in their website. Okay, so here is CARM.org, and what it stands for is Christian Apologetics and Research Ministry. This is an awesome resource for you when dealing with world religions and cults, but also with the secular worldview of postmodernism. So you can see uh, just the the the, the great menu they have over here on the left. Now, CARM was founded by Matt Slick. And, and when you look here on their team, you see this whole list of people. Matt Slick is right here. You see it says here, Matt Slick. Obviously, this is alphabetical. Um, so it says, is CARM's founder, director, researcher, writer, and radio host. He lives in Idaho. So you have um, Matt Slick, and, and that is him right there. Uh, th this uh, uh, gentleman is... Is, uh, is solid. He is a solid apologist, and um, I, would, I would highly encourage you to, uh, to research uh, this website. And so uh, this is a, a great menu over here to the left. And so you have apologetics. You can see all kinds of things you can look at there. The Bible, Bible difficulties. Maybe there's a difficult passage to talk about. So there's Bible difficulties, uh, Christian living, Christian theology, 
early church fathers, minor groups and issues. But then we get here, secular issues. So this is going to be where you have the, the hot topic items of our world today, dealing with abortion, atheism, COVID even, creation versus evolution, government, homosexuality, LGBTQ+, relativism, uh, social justice, great, uh, great things here uh, to look at. And um, when you look at world religions, you have uh, these world religions. Because that's what I want to focus on right now. And so you see the different ones. Well, how is it that that you would go and and um, witness to one of them? So you, let's click on Buddhism, and it takes you to Buddhism up here and a whole list of things. How is it that you would share uh, the gospel to the Buddhists? And so right here, the gospel for the Buddhists. And these are uh, just different topics that you can talk about to share Christ with uh, with a Buddhist. And you can read through this if you want, but it's just some points there. And then you get to the bottom here that would be very, uh, very relevant for the conversation and end of suffering. So we know that the Buddhist is trying to escape suffering. And so here is some, uh, some points there specifically for uh, the Buddhist. Uh, but then you can also uh, go to um, Hinduism. And it's like, well, how do I share Christ with the Hinduism? Well, here's, here's this link, how to share the gospel with Hindus. And so this link here will take you to uh, some, some points, you know, treating Hindus with respect, care for the Hindu, have a humble spirit, use stories to explain Jesus' forgiveness, uh, keep the personhood of God in mind, carefully emphasize the exclusivity of Jesus, basically how you can only go to, Christ, uh, go, go to heaven through Christ, uh, you know, be patient. So just some practical steps and, and how you can do that uh, there. You have uh, the, uh, under their uh, world religions tab, there's the world religions, and then there's the cults. So you have Mormonism, you know, Jehovah's Witness. Okay, so let's just click on Mormonism, there's videos. So all, all kinds of stuff uh, that you uh, you can look at. Okay, so um, the, pur the purpose I, br I brought you here to the to CARM website is that it's a tool that you can use. You know, in no way is Mid-America endorsing CARM or, or even me. I'm just saying it's a tool out there that you can use uh, if you want. Anything that you do, you want to check out. It's just that I've found that CARM uh, has, has been pretty helpful uh, with a lot, of, uh, a lot of things. So uh, that's my little disclaimer. Uh, but uh, my point is, is that uh, there's no possible way to go through each one of these world religions or cults and, and give you a detailed plan of how to share Christ uh, with them. If you want to do that, uh, get more of an idea with that, you would have to take world religions and cults class here at Mid-America or even... Um, uh, you know, focus in on one one people group and research that and the religion that they follow and how to share Christ uh, with them. Okay, so that's it for this PowerPoint. I'll see you in a second. All right, class, that's it for today. Next time, we'll be looking at contemporary strategies dealing with language learning. I'll see you then. Have a great day.